were talking about Bolton, David Heiser's three categories of people that believe in evolution. And we, we were talking about the first clat, uh, category, and that category is those people that just are anti-religion, and they're out to do whatever they can to destroy religion, destroy Christianity, destroy people's faith, and they're serious about it. And we talked about the first group, and we'll quickly go over that. That was uh, the NCSE, National Center for Scientific Education, headed by Eugenie Scott. They're very aggressive, they are, they're very bold. Uh, they, they are, uh, again, their goal is to, to try to get religion out of the, uh, uh, certainly get it out of the classroom, but, but get rid of it completely, if they could. But they've kind, of, they've kind of started a new tactic where they're trying to bring religion in to believe in evolution. And if they can get, if they can get to re the religious quote unquote leaders to buy into it, then, they've, then they've, won, they've won their case. And they elicit the ACLU, we talk about American Civil Liberties Union. And uh, I, I liken this, uh, what, what they're trying to do at least, uh, to scripture, 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14, do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to infiltrate, if you will. And also beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So there's even members, uh, conservative members of the church that are, that are buying into the theistic evolution, uh, or at least parts of it, at least parts of it. And, and that, I believe, is sad. Now, there's another group, and uh, this is not in your paper, uh, uh, but it's called, there, there's, a, there's a movement out there called the New Atheist Order or New Atheist Agenda. Now, these people are even more radical, and they don't, they don't do the tactic that, that the NCSC does. And their stated goal is to rid the world of religion. And if you look at their, their video uh, that Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss uh, 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 did, I mean, that's really their stated goal, and they're not shy about it. The documentary was called The Unbelievers, and it was uh, on their, what, what they believe about evolution, what they be, believe about religion. And again, the stated goal in this documentary is to get rid of religion. If you don't believe it, look at this quote by Lawrence Krauss. It says, you got to confront silly beliefs by telling them they are silly. That's talking about you and me. Silly beliefs is believe in God, believe in Jesus Christ, any religious that, religion that believes in God. And according to Lawrence Krauss, it's a silly thing. He says, if you're trying to con uh, convince people, um, that's mis misspelled there, but to convince people, pointing out what they believe is nonsense is better way than, uh, a better way to bring them around. So they just want to point out that religion in general is just nonsense. It's silly. And so they're really upfront about it. They talk about the evidence of reality, and this is a recurring theme that they have. So reality is believing in religion, and, and uh, non-reality is believing in God. That's their stated belief, and that they, that's a recurring thing. We need to bring people to reality. Now, you know, I don't, again, I, I talked about this last week a, a little bit, but why are they so aggressive? I, I don't know. They're, I don't know why they're so aggressive. It's like this is their religion. New, the new atheist, atheism is their religion, and they're real bold about it. And it, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a growing movement, unfortunately. They talk about spirituality, and we mentioned this a little bit last week as well. They don't mind you being spiritual. And they, they say, you can be spiritual, that's okay. But what do they mean about spiritual? When they say spirituality, they're not talking about religion. They're talking about looking at the universe and just wondering and in, in awe of it and how it all could have came together through natural processes and that sort of thing. So for the new atheist, when you're talking about religion, this is what you're talking about. It's awe and wonder. So you hear them talk about religion. That's really what they're talking about. And uh, they are uh, actively proselyting. That's why I say it's kind of like a religion. They want to go out and convince the world that, that atheism is true and that, again, uh, being a Christian or being religious at all is, is, uh, is silly and, and nonsensical. And, and that's what they believe. And they're very very uh, uh, passionate about it. These, this group, this first group that I talked about, the, the, the NCSC, the, the New Atheist, and people that fall in that category, I would say are almost impossible to persuade. In fact, I'm not sure it's even, even reasonable to try to argue with these people. You're not going to win it. I mean, uh, they're not going to look at it with an open mind. They're not going to look at the, the arguments that we're going to bring with an open mind. They've looked at these arguments, but their mind is already made up. 
and to try to even to persuade them the idea of intelligent design, design yeah, you're probably not going to win these people over. It's kind of like, I, I would say, a casting your pearls before swine, as the Bible talks about. Uh, I guess not you know, completely impossible, but just about, that's why I say virtually impossible to persuade them. Um, now there's the second group, and this is the group we're going to spend the most time on. And these are the people that are convinced evolution is true, and they just cannot take another position. Now they're not, they're not necessarily mean-spirited like the other group, and they're not out to necessarily destroy religion. And in fact, if you want to be religious, that's okay with them. They don't think it's, they, th they still think it's a fantasy, if you will. But they just can't take any other, any other position. This is most of the scientists who believe in evolution. Now, not everybody that believes in, not every scientist believes in evolution. We've got plenty of examples uh, in our class that we've looked at already. Very brilliant men, uh, astrophysicists, biologists, uh, geologists, on and on that don't believe in, in evolution. But I guess you could say pretty, pretty, pretty confidently that most scientists believe in evolution. And this is the group we're going to look at. And they just believe it because they can't take any other belief. And this, is, this has bugged me for a long time. I call it sort of the elephant in the room. Why, if we have so much evidence against evolution, which I believe we do, a lot of ev evidence against evolution, and, and I can see it, and some of the scientists that I just mentioned can see it, why can't other scientists see it if there's so much evidence? And Stephen Meyer talks about it in his book, Darwin's Doubt. Why can't other sci scientists that are very bright people see it? And you know, I, I finally it dawned on me, uh, the evidence for the research for both creationists and evolutionists is basically the same evidence. It's the interpretation of that, that evidence. And I threw in a little slide here just to show you that there's a picture here, and you've probably seen this picture before. Um, and who sees an old lady in this picture? Who sees a beautiful woman in this picture? See, they're both there. You can see an old lady if you have one point of view. You can see a young woman if you, uh, if you, uh, if you have a point of view. Now, now that I've mentioned that there's a kind of a beautiful woman in the picture, can you see it now? Still may not be able to see it, but there is. The left-hand side, she's got a ribbon coming out of her hair. See that? And you've got her face turned kind of a profile. I see the young woman when I look at that picture. Other people see the old woman in that picture. Here's another one. Who sees a rabbit in this picture? Who sees a duck in this picture? See, they're both there. You see the rabbit. You see the duck. It's the way you look at it. And so when you look at the evidence that we show in science and so forth, it's the way you look at it. So why can't scientists see our point of view? Why do the majority of scientists not see their point of view? And you know what it is? They just can't. They just can't. They can look at that picture of the old lady and never see the young lady. Never see it. I'm, I'm using that as, a, as an example. They just can't. And we're going to talk about why they can't in, in just a few minutes. But they just cannot. It's almost impossible for them. I said almost, but they just can't. And I say, I, I liken it to this. It's like the person that's colorblind. Uh, the person that is green, uh, yellow, uh, uh, green, red, colorblind, you show them a chart like that and they can't see those numbers. Now, I can't see the number on the right, <laughs> uh, but you know, can y'all see the, the number up on the left and then the number on the right and the number on the far left and whatever that is in the middle, I don't know. I think I see it now. Is there 12 or 17? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but some people can't see that no matter how, how hard they try it. Why? Because they are colorblind. They have no other way of seeing that number and that's the way the scientists are when it comes to the evidences that we have for the belief in a creator. And to prove that point, I've got a, a, a couple of quotes here. There's, first of all, there's no other scientific alternative for these individuals. They're looking for a quote unquote scientific point of view. And so I quote a few people here and I think it's important to, 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 to see what these people say. DMS Watson, who is a zoologist at London University, or it was, he says, evolution is a theory universally accepted. Listen to this not because it can be proved, but because the only alternative, special creation, is clearly impossible. Now you see why they can't believe in a creator? It's impossible. It's clearly, in their mind, it's clearly impossible. 
and not that it can be proved. And, and Richard Lowerton is, uh, is, even more, is even more dogmatic about it, if you will. Uh, this is a great quote, it's a little long, but let's read it all. He's a Harvard geneticist and he said, we take, meaning the people that believe uh, in evolution and the scientists that believe in evolution, he says, we take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of the constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of the extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific communi community for unsubstantiated just so stories, and that's what a lot of evolution is, it's just stories, and he admits that, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal, of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by a priori, adher priori adherence to material concept causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, but we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Now you see it, they just can't. They cannot accept it because uh, a divine creator, uh, religion is not materialism. It's not natural. It's not a naturalistic explanation. And all these things he says, I mean, you have no argument against, against that if that's their point of view. It's very, very difficult. And he admits there's some difficulties in the theory of evolution in that very comment. Also, Ernst Meyer. He makes this comment, this is an off-quoted comment from the 2000 Scientific American States uh, paper. No educated person any longer questions the validity of the so-called theory of evolution, which we now know is to be a simple fact. Absurd statement. Absolutely absurd statement. And yet a very educated man made that. So I suppose all the other scientists that have PhD degrees, and you and I in this room, are not, in his, in his point of view, educated, because that's the word he uses. Finally, along this line, 1973, this is another off-quoted uh, uh, verse, uh, off-quoted off, uh, uh, statement. He's a neo-Darwinist. Remember what neo-Darwins are? They're the people that, that bring mutations into the concept of evolution. And he says, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. So everybody that predated evolution just didn't know anything, I guess. So that, that's an absurd statement as well, just absolutely absurd. Is that true though? Is evolution science and creationism not? Is creation, can, can you be a scientist and be a creationist? Is creationism scientific simply because we believe there could be a supernatural cause of, of the universe? Well, I think it is, but the problem sometimes is in defining science. So science is the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical world, of, excuse me, of the physical and natural world through observation and experience, uh, uh, experiment, and that's the Oxford Dictionary. So to be scientific, you have to have, uh, you have, to have observation and exper experiment. Then from college physics, college physics textbook, John J. O'Dwyer. Science seeks to understand the world in terms of basic general principles involving observation, intuition, experimentation, debate, and reformulation. People that have, you know, that you've heard this before, right? That's what science is. But is that what evolution is? Or the study of evolution? No, it, there's, it's really, you, you can't verify it through experimentation, but yet we call it science and creationism is not. And then also, what is the scientific method? The scientific method is an attempt to falsify or prove a hypothesis or question. That's what the scientific method is. So if we're going to talk about science, this has to be what we're talking about, falsifying or proving a hypothesis or question. So in the historical sciences, I will call them, you're talking about evolution, you're talking about creation. Really, neither one of these fall into these definitions, do they? They really don't. You're looking at the evidence and trying to weigh the evidence against one or the other. And so here's another di uh, definition from Random House. Scientific method as a method of research in which a problem is in identified, relevant data gathered, a hypothesis formulated, 
and the hypothesis empirically tested. That's what science is. But we had a judgment that came down from Little Rock, Arkansas, a guy by the name of Judge William Overton. This was a famous case, and it was a case about whether or not creationism could be taught in the public schools in Arkansas, and this went before the courts. And I want you to look how uh, William Overton, in his brief, des describes science. Here it is. It's guided by natural law. It has to be explanatory by reference to a natural law. Do those first two statements, were those in the definitions of science we saw before? No, they weren't. It, it is testable against the empirical world. Its conclusions are tentative, i.e. Necessarily, not necessarily the final world, and it is falsifiable. Verse three are fine, but what Judge Overton was really describing was not science, and that's unfortunate, but that's what happened in the courts. What he was defining was naturalism, and that's not science. So in Judge Overton's point of view, something cannot be scientific unless it is quote unquote natural or materialistic. That's not our definition of science. That's not in those definitions that we read. And again, that's unfortunate. And so when you have that point of view, uh, you've got problems. And J.P. Moreland points out that creationism doesn't have to be non-scientific. He says, people who fought creationist for deriving their scientific hypothesis from the Bible or theological frameworks commit the genetic fallacy and are out of touch with the actual way science has been practiced repeatedly throughout history. People like Newton and Kepler and other people that were very brilliant men, uh, they didn't say natural, th that science had to be natural, did they? I mean, no, they were believers. They were, they were believers in God and in creation. So people that say you cannot be a scientist unless you accept a natural explanation for the world, that's not the way science has been done for many, 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 many years, for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. So they're out of touch. That's not correct. You can be a scientist and be very scientific and be a creationist and be a believer. And so it's nonsense, but that's what they want to say. If you're, if you're not an evolutionist, if, you, if, you, if you're not an atheist, then you really can't practice science. And I give an example. This is from the book In Six Days, which I mentioned at the very beginning of our class, which is a very good book. If you, haven't, if you don't have it, I highly recommend you get it. It talks about 50 different scientists throughout the entire world, all at least PhD degrees or higher, and uh, it gives some stories that they have about why they believe in creation. And one of them was a fellow by the name of Jeff Downs. And I forget at this point what his PhD was in, but his quote is, or, or what he talks about in there, in, in, his, in his part of that book, I think is interesting. And Jeff uh, gave a story. And this is from the point of view of a naturalist. Okay, I'm a naturalist, I'm a materialist. And I'm going to assume that the only way people die is through natural causes. That's the only way people die, natural causes. So I walk up into a park and I see a dead person, okay? I look at that person and I assume he's dead. My, 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 uh, uh, I've already decided that he's dead from natural causes. I turn him over and I see that he's got a knife in his back. Now if I was using deductive reasoning and I didn't assume there he died of natural causes. The assumption would be what? Somebody probably murdered that man. But you see, if I believe in natural causes, I'll never come to that conclusion. I'll never get there. Because I've already decided he died of natural causes. That's what we're up against. That's the problem. And so it is difficult to persuade someone to be a creationist if they've already made up their mind that Everything here has to come through natural processes and, and through random processes. Now again, I, I allude to um, Stephen Meyer's book, and I had never heard this before, but most of us, when we see a problem like that or come along, come along any problem, we use deductive reasoning. You know, if you've ever read uh, mystery novels, what do they use to come up with a conclusion? They come up, they, we use deductive reasoning, right? If you read Sherlock Holmes and that sort of thing, Sherlock Holmes comes up with deductive reasoning to try to figure out the case every time. And that's what we mostly, we mostly use. But scientists and the natural scientists, they do not use deductive reasoning. They use abductive reasoning. And I'm gonna show you the difference. 
deductive argument, major premise, if A has occurred, then B will follow as a matter of co course. Minor premise, A has occurred, hence B will follow as well. An example, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. That's deductive reasoning, right? Everybody gets that. Abductive argument, quite different. The abductive argument, the major premise is if A has, or if A occurs, then B would be expected as a matter of course. Minor premise, the surprising fact B is observed, the conclusion there is a reason to suspect that A has occurred. That's abductive reasoning. And that's quite different than deductive reasoning. And that's what's used in the natural sciences. And I'll use an example, the abductive inference. If a mudslide occurred, we would expect to, have fi to find failed trees. We find evidence of failed trees, therefore we have reason to conclude that a mudslide may have occurred. Does anybody see a problem with that reasoning? Yes. We've eliminated a lot of other things that could have caused those trees to fall, haven't we? And that's the problem with evolution. They've already accepted evolution. They've uh, already eliminated any other cause. That's ab abductive reasoning. And uh, like I say, a uh, very interesting way that, that uh, uh, Stephen Meyer brought, uh, brought this uh, to our attention. An example of abductive entrance if I was going to be looking at that previous scenario. Men die of natural causes. We find a man dead in the forest, therefore the man died of natural causes. Okay, it doesn't, it just, to me that doesn't make sense, but that's what's done in, in, the, in the natural sciences and by our evolutionist friends. They have really already established that evolution has occurred then anything else they see in nature assumes that and it fits their paradigm, if you will. So the fallacy of abductive reasoning, Stephen Meyer, it's the failure to acknowledge that more than one cause or antecedent might produce the same evidence or consequence. You see that? And I never heard that, it's kind of something you knew that was going on, but I never heard it put just like that by Stephen Meyer. And the majority of the scientists that we talk about have never really taken the time to examine the hard evidence. What I mean by that is the most of the scientists that are not in the evolutionary world, they may not even understand that evolutionists use abductive reasoning, because they don't. You know, the other scientists, the natural sciences, don't use abductive reasoning. They use deductive, uh, deductive reasoning. And so we put a lot of faith in science, don't we? You know, we, we, hear, we hear a research study come out and we hear, hear, hear these on the news and there are scientific studies and, and they come out in the, in the New England Journal or whatever the, the journal you might read and we put a lot of faith in it and science has always been right in the past. They've never been wrong. So they can't be wrong now. Well, no, of course that's not true and we're gonna spend a little time talking about that. One of the problems is the priority of the paradigm. If, if, again, the priority of the paradigm, I've already accepted a paradigm, no matter what that is. And we're going to look at a few of them that have occurred in science before, not just evolution, because that's, where, that's the paradigm we're in now. But once you've established that priority of a paradigm, it is hard to change it. It's like believing the earth is, fl is flat versus round. That was a hard thing to change, wasn't it? Very hard to change, because we've already, that's in our paradigm. And it's the, uh, Thomas uh, Kuhn, has, uh, Kuhn has talked about the priority of a, t of a paradigm. And once we've established that priority of a paradigm, then we will go at lengths to try to hold on to that paradigm and not switch it. Uh, Michael Denton again. We will go to extraordinary lengths to defend a theory just as long as it holds scientific intrinsic appeal. And he gives two examples of this, and these are two that we're, there's many examples, and we're, but we're just going to look at these very briefly because one of them we really have already looked at in this class. But the point is, scientists will go extraordinary lengths to hold of that, and that's the problem we're running up with evolution. Because it is now the paradigm, scientists will go at extraordinary lengths to uphold that paradigm. It's hard to change a paradigm. Once it's changed, you got it. And we talked about the geocentric theory or Ptolemaic theory. Earth, the Earth was the center of the solar system and held for many, 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 many years, hundreds and hundreds of years. 
then Copernicus came around and he proved really undeniably. It took a while, it took hundreds of years for people to finally accept it. But finally that paradigm has been shifted, right? Nobody now believes that the earth is the center of the solar system. We understand that the earth revolves around the sun and so forth. We're not the center of the solar system. Here's another one that I ran across in Michael Denton's book. The phlogiston chemistry was the idea that some substance was lost in combustion, that substance being phlogiston. And that was held for many, many years. We didn't know the true theory of combustion or, or the th uh, true facts of combustion. Took forever to change that. In fact, they had the actual evidence to show that it wasn't true, but scientists were ignoring that evidence. They were ignoring it because they had this paradigm they had this priority of this paradigm. And uh, Professor Butterfield in, in, in Evolution of Theory of Classes says, the last two decades of the 18th century gave one of the most spectacular proofs in history of the fact that able men who had the truth under their very noses and possessed all the ingredients for the solution of the problem, the very men who had actually made their strategic discoveries were incapacitated by the phlogiston uh, theory from realizing the implications of their own work. They couldn't see the forest for the trees. They couldn't see that there wasn't such a substance because that was already in their paradigm. Point is, it's very hard to shake a paradigm. I'll give you a, a professional example from, from my, my field of work. Probably a lot of you in this room still believe that ulcers are caused by what? Stress. Yeah, stress causes ulcers. And, that, and, and maybe spicy foods. But if you had an ulcer back in the 60s and 70s and, and in early 80s, then you, know, you were stressing about something. You must be worried about something because you got an ulcer. You know? So it's, uh, ulcers were, were caused by stress. The medical community thought that. That was the paradigm that we all thought. Ulcers were caused by stress. Well, we now know that ulcers are actually caused not by stress, the majority of ulcers. You can take a non anti-inflammatory like Advil, Aleve, you take a lot of those, you can get an ulcer, and we've seen that many a times. But the majority of people that we see in our practice that develop stomach ulcers have them because of this little bacteria that grows in the stomach called Helicobacter pylori. Not everybody has that bacteria. But if you have that bacteria, you may have an ulcer, you may get an ulcer. Well. Two guys from Australia, Dr. Robin Warren and Barry Marshall, how they came up with this new idea of ulcers. They were doing, they were gastroenterologists and they did research and they were looking inside people's stomachs and they were taking biopsies around the ulcers and they started noticing every time they did it, there was a little bacteria that was showing up and they named that bacteria Helicobacter pylori and they pr produced a paper that said, we think this is the cause of ulcers where the medical community laughed at them. Ah, oh, first of all, we don't, Oh, bacteria don't grow in stomach. Stomach has too much acid. You can't get a bacteria to grow in there. Furthermore, if, it is, if there is a bacteria there, then it has to be just an opportunistic bacteria. It's just there because it's there, but it has nothing to do with the ulcer. It grew there because there was an ulcer there. You see what I'm saying? Well, nobody believed them that they thought ulcers were caused by helicobacter. So Dr. Warren, I think it was Warren, might have been Marshall, but uh, one of them, decided the only way he was going to convince the, the medical community that H. pylori caused ulcers was to prove it on himself. So he had his partner scope him, look inside his stomach to see if he had any ulcers. Didn't have any ulcers. His stomach was clean. So he, put a vi he drank a vial of Helicobacter pylori. He literally drank this bacteria. Four to six weeks later, had his scope done. Lo and behold, guess what he had? Had an ulcer. You would think that would do it, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. No, it still took 12 years for the National Institute of Health in the U.S. to recognize their work and accept this new cause of peptic ulcers. So you see how hard, how hard a paradigm is to change? So now what do we do when we get somebody with an ulcer? We do a test on them. We see if they have H. pylori. If they have H. pylori, guess what we do? We put them on antibiotics, and that gets rid of it. It's very, very hard to shake a paradigm, even in the medical community. And I could go on and on about things that when I was a medical student that were absolute dogma fact. And if you did them, uh, if you didn't do what that, you were practicing bad medicine, probably even uh, guilty of, uh, of uh, malpractice, for example, uh, beta blockers. If you had somebody in congestive heart failure and you put them on a beta blocker, oh, that's bad. 
you know, get your lawyer out and get ready to go to court because you may get sued over that. Now you know what the deal is? If you don't put a patient on a beta blocker that has congestive heart failure, find you a lawyer. So things change. I mean, I could go on and on about it since I've been in practice. Of course, I'm an old guy. I've been in practice a long time. So I've seen a lot of those things, but there's many, many things in medicine. My brother John likes to talk about the pendulum changes. One time the pendulum is over here, one time the pendulum is over there. We're always chasing the research, and we're going to spend a little time on that to show that research isn't always what it's cracked up to be. What about evolutionary research? Okay, evolution is a science. I mean, there's research behind it, right? We read that paper, remember the first day of this class, how all these examples and science was there? Well, they're doing evolutionary research, and we spend billions of dollars. Now this is an old slide, so I'm sure it's much more than that. But the NAI, NA, NIH, in the NCF, and NASA have a budget of over 35 billion a year. And they do a lot of research. It's not always about, about uh, uh, evolution, but a whole lot is. Uh, but we have to be very careful about research. Research can be flawed and frequently is flawed. Richard Feynman, again, one of my fav favorite uh, astrophysicists, if you will, he says, science is a way of trying not to fool yourself. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself and, if you, and you are the easiest person to fool. He also said that science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. So what's the problem with evolutionary research? Evolutionary research is searching for the mechanism or cause of evolution rather than finding evidence for it. They've already assumed it. They've already assumed that evolution has occurred. So I'm looking for the mechanism now. That's all I'm doing if I'm doing evolutionary research. I'm definitely not looking at to see whether it occurred or not. Those billions of dollars being spent on research are not trying to prove evolution. See what I'm saying? So if you're looking at research and you've already made up your mind about the cause, you're going to find what you want. If you've already assumed a conclusion, you will likely find the cause. That's my quote, because <laughs> I think it's true. The point is all this is not surprising if evolutionary research is interpreted to fit their theory. In fact, I think it would be surprising if it did not fit because they've already assumed the cause. But is what most experts tell us correct? There's a good book written by David Friedman a few years ago and he says that experts, what most experts tell us is wrong based on flawed research. And he took a lot of his from a fellow by the name of Dr. John Ioannidis. Dr. Ioannidis, a brilliant man out of Johns Hopkins University, uh, he looked at medical research, I'm using medical research because that's what I'm familiar with, but it, this could apply to any research. And he looked at medical research and, and did a meta-analysis of all this medical research and came up with the conclusion that at least 75% of it was just dead wrong. And uh, wrongness, word that he coined, was the rule rather than the exception. Surprising, isn't it? So you see a paper that comes out that says uh, caffeine's bad for you, caffeine's good for you, what are you going to believe? probably be a 75% chance it's wrong. Uh, why is it wrong? I've tried to figure that out and so did Dr. Ioannidis and there's various theories. For one thing, sometimes researchers have a vested interest in the re results. Now, I'll use medical science again. If I'm paid by Pfizer to find out whether or not a drug causes, uh, uh, or if a drug lowers your cholesterol, I'm likely going to find that a lot of times because the research is going to be designed so that I come up with that. Not, not because I'm fraudulent, not because necessarily, I, that happens too, by the way. There has been fraud, uh, fraudulent research published, and people have gone to jail over that. And one of those was a fellow in England that was showing that uh, injections caused uh, autism. That research was, it was fake. It wasn't true, and yet it got published and everybody bought into it. That's just one example. That was literally flawed. But most people, it's more, I want the results I want, so the, 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 the study's gonna be, designed so I get those results. Maybe not intentionally, but it is. So they have a vested interest. And here's the other thing, research that doesn't prove what you want it to prove, guess what happens to it a lot of times? Well, it doesn't get published. They put it in the file drawer, they call it file drawer research. So when you're doing a meta-analysis on any subject, again, whether it's medicine or not, whether it's medicine or not, um, you, you're gonna, you're gonna, if you're not getting the results you want, it may or may not get published. So they have a vested interest, and that's the reason, amongst others. And I will tell you, this group that we just looked at in some detail, uh, they can be persuaded. If you can show them the, the, the poor reasoning that goes behind evolution, they can be persuaded. And if that wasn't true, we wouldn't have some of these books that I mentioned earlier. Wouldn't have them. The, a lot of the people in that, that uh, uh, six days book were former evolutionists. How did they get persuaded? 
because they finally realized the flawed, the, 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 the flawed mechanism, the abductive reasoning, if you will. So there's hope for that group. It may not be that great a hope, but there is that hope and you can change them. And we're gonna finish up very quickly on this third group. And the third, third group is most of the people that believe in evolution. They know little about it. Norris pointed out that there was a, a poll done recently that showed 64% believed in evolution. This is most of those 64%. They believe it cause the scientists believe it and they just follow along. And this group represents the vast majority who believe in evolution and they accept it. And these people can be persuaded. And I believe, this is again my quote, that any person of normal intelligence can see the issues of the debate and make an appropriate decision. People can change, and if that was not so, none of us would be in this room. We all had to make a decision to become a Christian, did we not? Did we not all have to make a change? Everybody has to make a change. And people can change. There are many, many examples in the New Testament of people that, cha that people can, uh, can change. And that's the purpose of our class, really to try to get to those people that are in that last group that only believe evolution because they've, been, they've, they've had biology in high school or college and they've just been repeatedly told over and over that it's a fact, it's a fact, it's a fact, it's a fact. And when you hear that over and over and over again, it's hard now to, to say, well, it must be because everybody believes that. No, that's not true and people can change. So